are gonna get crazy! <laughs> Most everyone's mad here. <laughs> Yes, 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 it is time that we go and get things started once again. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another exciting and fun-filled episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. Now, just yesterday, I actually had a blast by doing a little bonus episode of the uh, Cartoon Cast by talking entirely about E3. But this time around, we are going straight back into talking about animation. And let me tell ya, this week I have been scrambling, not just working on my videos, but also just gathering up all the news I can and pick out the best ones in order to go and discuss in Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. So there will be a lot of information to go and talk about and some very interesting stuff that we are going to go and look into. So with that said, guys, I would like to go into the chat wall and ask you, are you all ready for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Let me hear it, guys. Do you want to get ready? All right, so far we see a lot of people that are ready. Okay, good, 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 perfect. We are all ready, we are all set, and we can go and get things started. Now, like I said before, this week was also E3. And this was the time when there are a whole bunch of video games and a lot of developers and companies that are coming out and revealing some brand new announcements and exciting trailers regarding upcoming games. And especially with Nintendo, that was the one that really got a lot of people's attention. But then Disney was on the side and they saw all these trailers happening and all the hype that was going on and they were thinking, oh yeah, yeah, that's actually very nice. But uh, two can play at this game and they supplied with a trailer that really got a lot of people hyped up for one of their upcoming movies. Now if you think that all the new reviews of Toy Story 4 makes you really excited about one of their upcoming animated films, well you ain't seen nothing yet until you have seen the trailer for Frozen 2. So let's go ahead and check this one out. Where the fridge do I begin with this one? Okay, so the thing with Frozen 2 so far, with what we have gotten, and even with the first teaser trailer that we've had a few months ago, one thing that I was really surprised about is the fact that it was taking itself very seriously, where even with the presence of characters like Olaf and Sven, they are pretty much telling us that this is a lot more of an epic adventure than something that would be a little more lighthearted and fun and we'll have a few laughs here and there. But this time though, they're just emphasizing, no, 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 no. This is all serious. This is all real. And we are about to go into something epic right over here. And surprisingly enough, the tone is still staying with this trailer, uh, with this new trailer of Frozen 2, that now they're being a little bit more serious about it, and they are a real, uh, they are revealing a little bit more about what the plot entails. Uh, I know that technically this week they also revealed a little bit more of a synopsis of what's going on with Frozen 2, but admittedly. I did not read it, mainly because I want to keep a little bit more of the surprises, and uh, I'll get a little bit more into that uh, a little later. But going back into this, so far, uh, it seems that this trailer is telling us that the plot seems to be revolving around Elsa. Like, Elsa is going to be much more of a central figure and much more of the main character, where now we're going to be learning a lot more, not necessarily just about Elsa, 
but regarding her powers, like the origins, where it came from, and what more it could possibly do. Like, at one point, we saw that all these uh, little crystal, like, uh, uh, actually, uh, I just want to mention how probably one of the best looking moments of the trailer is when we see Elsa and she's in that red purple dress and we see the images actually hold on sorry just gotta mute that a little bit uh don't don't want that to overshadow my voice so yeah you see the horse you see like the giant ogres that they're all made of stars and then like you see the wind and uh, some of the leaves that are following it, which is very reminiscent to the effect of uh, what they have done previously with Pocahontas. So that's like a pretty cool uh, throwback. And it does help to make this movie a little bit more stylized, especially with the effects. And I'm sure this is going to be a movie where the special effects, the visual effects, uh, like when you see Elsa's powers and uh, all the wind and all the elements happening, like that's going to be something that will be a true standout moment to this feature. And from there, and, and speaking of which, speaking of those elements, uh, seeing the horse and then seeing uh, the giant, the, the, well, the giants or the ogres and stuff like that, we actually do get a whole lot more. Like, now we are seeing, like, these surprise elements. Like, uh, it, it starts out with a little bit of the saying that what we just saw with Elsa trying to escape this island and uh, running in the, like, running on top of the ocean with her ice powers. And then suddenly, like, she gets in and suddenly we see this little moment where she meets up with this water horse, like, literally a horse that's made of water. And then, like, even at the end, we see this moment where Elsa is hiding from these giants that are probably looking for her and these are going to be moments where they will tell you there will be this element of like unknown magic and mystery and oh <laughs> suddenly i just remembered about what i wanted to talk about before and uh one thing that it did answer uh, a question regarding what we had from the previous trailer from uh, the teaser trailer i just want to try to go and uh look for it specifically where would that be Part B. Oh, yeah, like somewhere over here where somehow Elsa is the one who actually caused all these little ice crystals that were just suddenly floating all around Arendelle. So that was one answer, uh, one question that was suddenly answered. And then we do get a little bit of a hint about what they are somewhere right at the end over here, like when we see uh, the whole gang, like. Uh, Anna, Elsa, Kristoff, Sven, and Olaf, where, like, you see these pillars. And on these pillars, you see the markings that are very similar to what's actually on uh, the ice crystals that Elsa would go and produce. So there, there are some elements that we do know a little bit that it does answer some questions, but at the same time, it still leaves a lot of the element of mystery, that it still gives us a lot of questions regarding what's going on. And I think that's actually the true beauty of this trailer, is that it still leaves us guessing about what is going on, because there are still some moments that we know is going to be happening, but we don't know specifically what's even going on like a good example uh the flame there was at one point where you see um elsa and i think olaf as well from the previous trailer where they were stuck in this giant circle or i think a heart shape or something like that but, but it was like this purple flame or purple pink flame that was produced and now like we see over here it looks like it seems to be produced by this um fire rabbit or I think like this, it's like some kind of spirit. It's like a, a rabbit. It's like floating around and it's causing all these fires in the forest. And all that is actually happening. Um, like it, we don't know what's happening, but we know it is happening. Well, at least we know where it's coming from, but we don't know why specifically. And I don't know, maybe it is just me. And, and by the way, this is just a bit of a crazy, dumb theory Maybe this might not be true, uh, but honestly, there's one moment that I feel like I think they just uh, made a little bit of a reference to one of the pre to the ride that Frozen actually replaced at Epcot Maelstrom. And if you guys don't believe me, it's actually at this moment right over here where you see Anna and Olaf that 
they're on uh, on a kayak made of ice, and they're going down into this cave, and then suddenly they go down a waterfall, uh, which is a little bit similar to what happened in Maelstrom, where you're kind of like in this mythical forest, and then suddenly you go down a, a waterfall. Maybe it's just me. This is just a theory. But um, honestly, I do feel like there is a little bit of a nod to that, especially when Maelstrom was replaced by Frozen Ever After. So maybe it's a coincidence. Maybe it's just me. But I don't know. I just feel like I wanted to point that, that out because it is actually very interesting. But overall, my God, this trailer is amazing. They really nailed it hard uh, in terms of keeping the mystery element, but still revealing us uh, a little bit of what's going to be happening in Frozen 2. Like, this is exactly what a trailer is supposed to do, to show us a little bit, give us a little, a little taste of what this movie is going to be, but not necessarily too much. Don't give us too much of a taste where we want to have a little bit more like this is teasing us a little bit but now we want like now we're pretty much enticed to see like what else is going to be going on uh, oh oh excuse me okay now that i got that cleared out um and honestly this is exactly why uh, honestly this is pretty much right up there now as possibly my most anticipated movie for the rest of the year. Like, I know I got a lot of them up there, especially with uh, Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, but Frozen is immediately up there right on top. And yes, I know that technically there is also Toy Story 4, but uh, keep in mind, as I am recording this, Toy Story 4 is actually less than a week away, so I don't have to wait for that long uh, in order for me to build up anticipation. So I know that's going to be coming real soon, but right now with Frozen 2, it just looks absolutely amazing. Uh, the animation so far that they are presenting to us, it is absolutely beautiful. Uh, the tone still feels like they're going to keep things uh, a lot more serious in this case, which is an interesting new twist uh, to uh, a Disney movie especially, but it is very welcome and it might deliver us something new. So overall, yeah, this trailer, it really is effective. And n normally the thing is, with, with Disney trailers, usually they don't do well uh, to do justice of how this movie is going to be. Like normally with, uh, with these trailers, especially with Disney, they would show us as I stated before, like some kind of fun-filled adventure with a little bit of comedy, trying to appeal a little bit more to the kids, uh, more so than the adults. But this time around, it look it like I think Disney might have hired a new group of marketing people for this. But so far, I will say the marketing is working extremely beautifully, and I may say kudos to Disney for doing such an extravagant job so far with these trailers. And I cannot wait for this movie to come out, which will be out on November 22nd. So uh, just a little bit of a heads up on that. For those of you who want to know when is it going to be coming out, when are you excited for this? So uh, just keep an eye out for November 22nd. Okay, so with that said, I would like to go and ask you guys, what do you all think about, Fro uh, about the trailer for Frozen 2? Is it something that you guys are excited about? Do you think the trailer works for you? Uh, are you guys excited? Are you a little disappointed? Um, do you want to see it? Do you not want to see it? Let me know what you all think right now. All right. Oh, boy. Okay. We got massive audience participation over here. So let's see now. Uh, the trailer looks epic. Uh, this movie looks like it wants to try something new rather than reusing the plot and elements from the first film. Uh, the animation looks amazing, although not surprising since this is Disney. Uh, the trailers haven't really revealed any sort of songs yet. I hope there is no twist villain or there is a villain at all. I wonder how people who hate Frozen will feel yet and how much they try to despise the sequel. Also, uh, which is better, an animated film that has a twist villain? Oh, okay, well, I guess the comment kind of stops there. Uh, but... No, I definitely do agree with you there. And yeah, of course there are going to be those people, like that vocal minority, who's going to try desperately hard to hate this, mainly because 
Frozen is popular. It's still the most a uh, high the still the uh, highest grossing animated feature of all time. And they want to be cool and edgy and try to be the contrarian from everyone else. Try to say that Frozen sucks. It's gonna be the it's gonna be the worst. This sequel is gonna be the worst of all time. It's gonna be as bad as the Emoji Movie. And to those people, like I don't care because. As I stated, they're just trying to hate on it because right now it is popular and they want to hate on things that is popular and they think that they're cool and edgy by doing so. So honestly, with all the hate that they want to try to spread around, I don't care. I'm I'm just going to ignore them. They don't really have any like proper basis on it. So yeah, honestly, if they're really going to be desperate to hate on the sequel just because they don't like on Frozen, then honestly, yeah, I really don't care what they think. Okay, so... Uh, let's see, jumping on to the next comment that we got here, uh, has everyone, uh, has anyone noticed that every three years we got a Disney princess movie that takes place in a different season? Tangled was in spring, Frozen was in winter, Moana was in summer, and, uh, looking at this, uh, Frozen 2 is in fall and autumn. Also, this kind of reminds me of The Hobbit, especially with the giants. Um, I don't know. Oh boy, dude. I think you might have started a new Disney theory because I know uh, Disney theorists will go crazy with all these things. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to jump into that. So uh, that's something for, for the Disney theorists. And I, I'm just saying that's most likely a bit of a coincidence. And uh, I'm sure some people might even debate with you regarding if Tangled is spring. So, okay. Anyways, um, uh, Let's get back into over here. Uh, what else do we got? Talk about a complete tonal shift. I love how they kept most of the plot details vague. Kind of like how Endgame was marketed. I also admire how the focus has shifted towards Elsa. And the new type of creatures and monsters how, uh, hold great potential. I might check it out. Even if I'm not uh, going to expect this to be better than Ralph Breaks the Internet. Also, uh, I figured the case with the underwater horses. It's a seahorse. It's a seahorse. I think that's a little too easy of a pun to go and make there, so I'm not going in that. But, you know, you actually do bring up a very good point regarding Endgame, and I think Disney is actually taking notes from Endgame in order to go and do the marketing of Frozen 2. That could be the case, where they don't want to necessarily reveal too much and try to make the tone feel as serious and epic as possible. To not make Frozen 2 feel like another movie is going to be coming out, but rather to make it feel like an event. And I think that's what Disney is trying to do. Make Frozen 2 not a movie, but an event. I think that's kind of the idea. Okay, what other comments do we got here? We got a whole bunch. Uh, first, uh, first, the visuals, especially the magic, looks amazing. Second, uh, I wonder... Uh, I wondered if they will go, oh, I wonder if they will go into uh, her backstory of her powers. Third is mystery thing is caused by some something or someone. Fourth uh, is Eliza May face on, or probably, uh, fourth is Elsa May face uh, a someone that is like her but bad. Maybe she would be dragged in to being a bad queen. And five, uh, I'm excited as hell, man. I can't wait. You see? Look at that person. Look at that comment that I just read here. This is the thing that Disney wants you to do. To raise questions. To think about the possibilities. That really does show how this trailer really works. How it is amazing and it does so well in order to sell this movie. To really make you wonder and to really have you curious to know what it is. And the only answer is to go and check out the movie. That's what Frozen wants you to do, dude. That's what they want you to do. Okay. Uh, anyways, uh, let's see here. The trailer just made me more and more excited for the movie. Also, I just remembered that I theorized that we might see the origins of Elsa's ice powers back in episode 38 of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. Uh, does this trailer make me some kind of fortune teller? Nah, you're just really good at guessing. That's probably my guess. All right, uh, we still got a whole lot more, but I'm just going to go and read one more. Uh, I'm actually pretty excited to see what the sequel gives us. Uh, I'll admit, uh, I did kind of fall out of the love of Frozen after a while, mostly because of the hype and some of the cliches used in the film. Kingdom, uh, Kingdom Hearts 3 kind of helped, but seeing these trailers is really bringing me back to the excitement. 
And you do bring up a, a pretty good point, actually, considering that with uh, Kingdom Hearts 3, it did help a bit uh, to reconnect people with Kingdom Hearts, or especially with many of the Disney fans to, you know, get back into the mood of Kingdom, uh, of not, not Kingdom Hearts, but Kingdom Hearts helped bring Disney fans to get back into the mood of Frozen and then getting back into uh, a new adventure. So seeing this trailer, and especially with the help of Kingdom Hearts 3, yeah, this really is Elsa's comeback this year. Okay. I just needed a bit of that. So now we can go ahead and jump on to our next story. And for our next story and for uh, the next stories that we do have, I am actually going to be talking about what could be the animation equivalent of E3, the Annecy International Animation Film Festival. I don't know why, I, I almost feel like I want to say expo than festival for some reason. But the main thing is, is that it is a festival. Yes, uh, Annecy is often considered to be one of the biggest events in animation of the year. This is the moment where a lot of independent companies and even a lot of mainstream companies would all come together along with a whole bunch of artists from, and animators from all around the world to go and reveal a lot of announcements, a lot of trailers, a lot of new images, and also a whole lot of details and a whole lot of screenings of movies to show what's going to be to come. And of course, there are, as I stated, a lot of announcements that actually happen. And we're going to go a little bit in a transition over here where we're still sticking into the theme of Disney. But this time around, we're going to be looking a little bit into what Disney television has revealed for us. And uh, so far, what happened is that the main thing that they did present, or one of the main things that they have presented is that they talked a lot regarding what's going to be happening with one of the upcoming Disney Plus animated series, Monsters at Work, which is the TV spinoff of Monsters, Inc. So they really went into a lot of details about what's going to be happening, this plot, who's going to be involved, and all the, you know, all those elements. And from there, they also talked about uh, different TV shows that are going to be happening, uh, not just on television, but also that's coming out on Disney+, Plus, uh, where they discuss a bit about a children's cartoon called Bluey, and also discuss a little bit about the uh, new upcoming animated, sp uh, animated TV spinoff of 101 Dalmatians, which is called 101 Dalmatian Street. But the main thing here that we are going to be talking about is going to be none of those. It's not going to be any of that or any or any of the other elements that they talked about like uh, Amphibia or the Owl House or anything like that. But instead, what we are going to be revealing is actually going to be a brand new Disney Plus series based on Chippendale. Yes, our favorite little chipmunks are coming back in a brand new series with a brand new style. So I'm going to be reading here from my source at d23.com as it states, <clears throat> Everyone's favorite troublemaking chipmunks, Chip and Dale, are making mischief in a brand new Disney Plus original series. It was just revealed at the Annecy International Animated Film Festival that Chip and Dale is currently in production for Disney Plus. The seven-minute episodes will chronicle the beloved little critter's adventures in the big city through non-verbal classic-style comedy. Disney's London-based animation team partnered with award-winning Parisian production studio Xylum Animation to develop the series, which combines a traditional style of animation with contemporary comedic narratives. Uh, Jean Cairol directs Chip and Dale, and Marc Dupontavis serves as a producer. So that's the main thing that Disney, uh, that Disney Television wants to go and reveal at Annecy, is the fact that we are getting a brand new Chip and Dale series. And it's very interesting to see what they are actually doing here, because in a way, the best way to describe it is that they're taking Chip and Dale... And they're bringing them back 
to their roots. Now, I know that technically uh, this is supposed to be a brand new contemporary setting for Chip and Dale that now they have to deal with troubles with living around the big city and maybe interact with a few other characters because they also did reveal uh, a brand new picture where you see like this angry fish that's coming out of the sewers or you see like two different birds like a skinny tall bird and a little fat bird that's just laughing at Chip and Dale. And uh, there will be those new contemporary elements, but what I mean by going, uh, by bringing Chippendale back to their roots is that now they're just being chipmunks and nothing more. Because throughout the years, we have seen Chippendale in various of different roles. And probably the most famous would have to be Chippendale's Rescue Rangers, where you have the characters Chip and Dale dress up like uh, Indiana Jones and Miami Vice. And then from there, we also see Chip and Dale in various of other roles from other different TV shows. And especially with, uh, speaking of Kingdom Hearts, like you see Chip and Dale as like pilot mechanics or something like that, where they have to put on like a weird role that you would never expect these chipmunks would play and they would have to do that like they got to help you out with uh make like making your spaceship in kingdom hearts so that, that that's what they would usually do nowadays with chip and dale but now it seems that with this series they're just putting them back into being chipmunks in a cartoon because when you do look back at chip and dale like the classic cartoons back in 1943 that's essentially what they are. All they did, like, in terms of their role, is just play as chipmunks. And usually with Chip and Dale, they would often play as, like, um, it's hard to describe. Not necessarily the victims, per se, but kind of like the heroes of their cartoons. Where often they would be pitted uh, against Pluto or Donald Duck. And you would often see Chip and Dale constantly harassing or just trolling either Pluto or Donald throughout the entire cartoon where all they want to do is try to get rid of the little pests and that's it. And even with the non-verbal element, that is actually something that I do feel is a bit of a new throwback. That is actually something that I feel like it is very reminiscent to how they used to be. Now, I know that technically when looking back at the old cartoons, technically Chip and Dale did actually talk. But it's not necessarily their dialogue that they are known for. Because with Chip and Dale, when you think about the old dialogue of Chip and Dale, what they would say is usually something that's not often comprehensive. Like, you would just see them on the side going, <laughs> you know, it's just little speech patterns just talking a little too fast. But it's mainly their physical comedy that they would go and execute, you know, bring out a bit of slapstick comedy towards either characters like Pluto or Donald Duck. That's what they're often known for. And that seems to be what they want to get back into, including the fact that it says that they're in the big city through nonverbal classic style comedy. And that is something that I actually do hope for, that if they really want to go and try to capture uh, the classic style of the Chip and Dale cartoons, I really do hope that it's not just them that are like the central characters and that maybe we will get a little bit more characters for Chip and Dale for them to play with. Um, considering that they are in the big city, maybe they will uh, go after like some guy in a hot dog stand or maybe we will see a lot more with uh, the pigeons or the angry little fish or uh, maybe some taxi driver or like some guy that's just in the park that they will constantly harass. Maybe there's a, a little bit of a plot line right, uh, like that. But the main thing is that they just want to make Chip and Dale cartoons. They just want to have that as a throwback. And um, one more thing that I would like to go and discuss about is actually regarding the art style. So far, the only thing that we have seen is just this one image of Chip and Dale that they're in the middle of the street. They're trying to run because there's a taxi that's coming in front of them. The pigeons are laughing at them. And you see the angry fish that's popping out of the sewers like with the entire lid that's just on top of him. And I would say, honestly, 
I do understand with what they want to do with this art style. It's a little bit more simple than what they have previously done with uh, the older iterations of Chip and Dale, but I see this and I do feel like this is uh, very reminiscent to what they did with the new Mickey Mouse cartoons, you know, to have that style be a little bit similar to this, where they keep it a little bit more simplistic and maybe a little bit more uh, rubber hose, where they lean a little bit more onto the cartoon, even more by Disney standards. But in this case, uh, they still want to keep the charm and still keep on uh, the characteristics and especially how they do emphasize a lot more of the round elements. So that honestly is something that I feel like it is uh, a little bit of a reference to the uh, new Mickey Mouse cartoons. Maybe Chippendale has already made an appearance in there and they look completely different than how they do here. But uh, it does remind me of how they rebooted Mickey Mouse in a way. It's the same way that they would over here. But from there, I would say that of course, with a new style of Chippendale... You gotta have at least some people in the cartoon community complaining about it. Because so far that's the biggest criticism that I've heard. That there are some people who absolutely hate this new style of Chip and Dale. And already they're acting angry about it. They're lashing out about this new series. And they're calling out for boycotts and whatever. And from there all I can say to those people is just oh good god shut the fridge up. Yes I get it. You are upset because you're so used to wearing your nostalgia goggles and you're angry that Chippendale doesn't look like exactly how you used to remember them. It's a brand new style made for a brand new audience and if you don't like it, if you're upset because change is happening and they're not doing it exactly how you wanted to do it like how it was in the classic cartoons or Chippendale's Rescue Rangers, then shut the fridge! Up, man! I am tired of your constant whining of the freaking cartoon reboots. Holy crap, man. Seriously. And, you know, this is why people still don't respect the cartoon community. And, I mean, it's very valid, to be honest. So, yeah, overall, though, um, I feel like I am pretty curious. And it does make me a little bit optimistic. I Like, when I was a kid, I used to watch some of the Chippendale cartoons. And... You know, honestly, if it does be res if it can get respectful uh, to the classic cartoons and be a throwback to that style, then honestly, I think this one could actually have some potential, and it could be a nice new addition to the Disney Plus, uh, to uh, yeah, to uh, the Disney Plus streaming service. Uh, so far, from what I've heard, there are, there are going to be 39 seven-minute uh, seven minute cartoons. So it, it sounds like it's going to be a nice little thing to have that in case there's nothing else, you want to have like uh, some quick time to spend, then you can have it with uh, Chip and Dale. So that, that seems to be the main thing with it. And uh, I don't know when exactly it's going to be coming out. It doesn't necessarily say a release date. Rather, if it's going to be launching with Disney+, Plus. Or that it could be coming out sometime in 2020. But we do know that this Chippendale series is happening. So with that said, uh, I would like to go into the chat wall. And I want to ask you guys, what do you think so far about this Chippendale series? Is this something that you guys would be interested in? Uh, or is this something that you wouldn't want to watch? Uh, how do you feel about Disney rebooting Chippendale? Let me know what you think. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, I like the way this reboot looks. The Flash will probably work well as the image looks like it'll be fast paced and exciting and the art style fits extremely well. I'll probably watch it if I get Disney+. Plus. Alright, that's nice dude, that's nice. Uh, not gonna lie, I honestly wanted a reboot of Chippendale Rescue Rangers, but this does hold promise either way. I'm very intrigued to see what the guys at Disney have in store, although the dialogless reboot idea brings back bad memories of Popeye, uh, minus the joy of singing Johnny Johnny. Oh god, yeah. Uh, but I'll check it out if I ever purchase Disney+. Plus. Now let me ask you, who wants some Cuckoo Cola? We're having a, uh, we're having us a little fantasy party. <laughs> oh, definitely true, dude. But yeah, th you do actually bring up a very good point, though, with, uh, with Popeye. And if you guys uh, don't remember, there was a new online series of Popeye that they want to try to reboot, and they really tried to aim it towards kids. 
And the way that they rebooted, oh god, it really did feel a lot more like a it really did feel more like a freaking cereal commercial where they really emphasize a lot more of the fact that oh Popeye is all about the spinach he likes to plant spinach we got to protect the environment for the spinach and Bluto doesn't want to chase olive oil he wants to get the, the tasty spinach it's like oh god like I, I do understand how it can go wrong honestly I feel like the factor that it doesn't have any dialogue that's not the issue of the Popeye series. It, it, it's pretty much a lot. Uh, it's pretty much everything else. But one thing that we can at least hope is that Chippendale doesn't go towards that route. Okay, so let's see now. Um, I trust Disney to reboot Chippendale. They rebooted Mickey Mouse and DuckTales and it worked very well. Uh, maybe Chippendale reboot could work. Okay, that's nice. Uh, let's see. Uh, the show does have potential. I really like Zlum Animation as they made shows like Augie and the Cockroaches as well as Zig and Sharko. So I am optimistic about this. I have never heard about those shows, but I would say, uh, okay. <laughs> Alright, anyways. Um, it's not the worst of the current art styles I've seen, though. It looks fine to me, though, as long as I could match the appropriate tone and capture the spirit of the original shows like the new Mickey Mouse shorts. Exactly. You know, it, like, it, and uh, one of the commenters actually said it best that this does look like it's going to be something that will be fast-paced. And especially something that it is dialogueless, I think that might be something that they got to emphasize a little more to really make it fast-paced in order to make those seven minutes worth it. Uh, let's see now. Uh, where are we? Uh, I like the new, uh, wait, oh yeah, no, 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 I didn't read this. I like the new look of Chip and Dale and I'll watch Disney Plus. Also, I wish Disney rebooted Rescue Rangers like the 2017 DuckTales reboot. Well, honestly, at that point, um, if that's something that they want to do, well, actually, technically, I did hear that, uh, they technically are rebooting Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers, but not as an animated series, but I think as a live action animation hybrid. I don't know, maybe I'm completely wrong on that. You can correct me if I am wrong, but I have heard something along those lines. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that's like, they're pretty much telling you, yeah, you want you want a Chippendale Rescue Rangers reboot? Well, be careful what you wish for. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, so, uh, apparently I might, I might be right on this one, and honestly, I'm kind of scared if I'm right on that. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna read one more little comment here. Uh, I honestly think they look kind of cute. Looks kind of reminiscent to the recent Mickey Mouse cartoons, uh, except maybe a bit of a sketchy, but good enough to possibly make it its own series. I also kind of say I kind of miss Chip and Dale, as they are like the Disney equivalent of Tom and Jerry. Okay, that that is definitely nice. That is nice, dude. Okay, so with that said, I think we're pretty much all good with this Chip and Dale series. And now it is time that we are going to go and move on to our next story that's going to be a little bit similar to this, where we are going to be rebooting some old cartoons and be a little bit of a throwback where they are going back to their roots. And I just want to say right now that out of all the things from Annecy, this is actually the one that is the most anticipated, that animation fans and animators are like, were highly anticipated to see the new look of this brand new cartoon. That they want to see this brand new iteration to see what these animators have in store for us. So what we are going to go and check out is actually going to be the Looney Tune cartoons. Yes, the Looney Tune cartoons actually did make their premiere at Annecy, revealing a handful of cartoons. But amazingly enough, folks, there is actually one that they put out to the public. And we are going to go and check that one out right now, actually. I got the clip right over here. So let's go ahead and check our first ever look of the Looney Tunes cartoons. So let's go see this. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, the Looney Tunes cartoon that was actually called uh, Dynamite Dance, in which it was actually directed by uh, David Gamil. 
And uh, to give you a little bit of a description of what is going on, because I'm sure uh, the people who are just listening to this uh, through like just a podcast in itself, they might be just a little bit confused because all they heard was just explosions and classical music. So to go on to Variety, uh, just to give you a little description of what this is all about, it has stated that what you just saw is a classic as as classic as they come. Dynamite Dance is an explosive thrill ride b featuring Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd, dressed in his traditional brown hunting suit and hat, in a cartoonishly violent, non-verbal, and woo excuse me, classically orchestrated back and forth, set to Emil Kerr's Poncha. Uh, said to Emilcare Poncielli's classic Dance of the Hour, Elmer fails time and time again to get his hands on bugs. Instead of ending up in within his hands, ma oh, eh, oh, sorry, <laughs> kind of uh, misread that a little bit. Kind of tripped on my own words even. Instead of uh, instead ending up with hands, mouth, and ears full of iconic red stick of ac uh, Acme dynamite. And to give you guys a little bit of uh, some details regarding what this whole thing is about, like the whole uh, idea with Looney Tunes cartoons, it has stated that according to uh, according to Peter Brongard, who's kind of like the head of this whole thing, uh, Looney Tunes cartoons is uh, of the 200 plus shorts that will be produced in this branch of cartoons, 20 and 30 are already completely finished, with close to 150 others in various stages of production from storyboard and on. In the end, the studio will have created more than 1,000 minutes of Looney Tunes content. And the whole goal here is not necessarily make a whole series, but to just make their own individual cartoons. That basically, Warner Brothers Animation has gathered a whole bunch of different animators across the field so that they could have a chance to go and create their own Looney Tunes cartoon that is very reminiscent, that's meant to be paying a tribute and an homage to the classic cartoons back from the 30s and 40s. So bringing Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Elmer Fudd, and Porky Pig back to their origins back in the uh, 30s and 40s when they were developed by people like Tex Avery and Bob Clampett and maybe a little bit as well with some of the uh, later Looney Tunes directors like with uh, Chuck Jones, with uh, Fritz Freeling, with Bob McKimson and all those guys. So it's meant to be an entire throwback and we just had one major example with uh, Dynamite Dance and Honestly, I think Variety said it best that this is as classic as it can get. And honestly, with me, I do feel pretty surprised and uh, very pleased with the fact that this is actually smooth animation. When you do look at this, like, th this isn't something that is, like, television animation quality. This is actually something that you could tell that the animators behind this, they put in the effort to make it just like the classic cartoons where the animation isn't necessarily choppy or stiff, but they want to make it as smooth as possible and even look as uh, classic as well. Because when you do look at the characters like uh, Bugs or Elmer Fudd, uh, just trying to get a, just want to get a classic look at them. Yeah, like when, when you do look at Bugs Bunny and when you do look at Elmer Fudd, they very much are reminiscent to how they are back in the 1940s with that style. It's not necessarily going after a new modern look. They're not necessarily going simplistic with it or trying to be round or anything like that. They really want to try to emphasize that classic style and they want to present the classic style. And even with here, like everything about it just feels absolutely timeless and they really have captured that formula of what it is um, that really makes those cartoons iconic and really memorable. Like one major element that you've probably noticed is actually regarding, oh, uh, actually, hold on a sec. Can I just want to double check. Okay. 
<laughs> Sorry, I just want, wanted to see, like, on Twitch, this is like, is things, uh, like, are things okay here? Okay, yeah, Th they are, they definitely are, so, uh, don't worry, everything's fine, so, anyways, back to what I was talking about. Yes, with the music, now, that is actually an integral piece that, uh, the Looney Tunes, and even to a certain extent, other companies as well that, that they have used, like Disney, that they would use classical music in order to be kind of like the map of the entire uh, cartoon. Like, for example, with Dance of the Hours, uh, in terms of animation, normally you would think about Fantasia, where you would think of uh, an entire ballet with hippos, crocodiles, uh, elephants, and ostriches. But this time around, this is just a classic cartoon of Elmer Fudd chasing Bugs Bunny, but... Bugs would always have the upper hand and constantly using dynamite like that's the major throwback that they want to use like the main theme is just dynamite it's like oh you failed to catch me well here's a stick of dynamite exploding on your face all like no matter what always and uh the whole cartoon is meant to go and have fun with all the different ways that Bugs can go and deliver Elmer Fudd and you see like all the like no matter how they would do it like, rather it be just simply just giving giving it to him or, like, even setting up, like, an entire big moment. Like, just stacking all the sticks of dynamite and then just exploding it on Elmer Fudd. Or even um, one of the most memorable moments of the cartoon is, like, when you see Elmer Fudd fall down. Like, he fell off a cliff and then, bu like, Bugs would just deliver him all the dynamite whatever possible way he can. He just always gives Elmer Fudd a stick of dynamite. So no matter how they would do it, they got to deliver it to Elmer Fudd. And even like at the end, uh, actually, it just reminded me like even like kind of tricking Elmer Fudd or even like uh, something that Bugs has never done in a long time, I believe, is actually. Uh, oh, where was it? Oh, no, it's like right over here where we see Bugs Bunny giving Elmer Fudd a kips on the lips. Now that, you know, that is honestly another classic throwback to, uh, with, like, Bugs and Elmer's relationship, or even, like, trick, you know, tricking Elmer Fudd, thinking that they're doing something, that Bugs is doing something nice to him, like, by giving him the cake. It, it's just, a lot of these, it, it, it's absolutely beautiful. If this is what we are getting with these Looney Tunes cartoons, then honestly, I'm pretty excited to see what else they would have to offer. Now, from what I've heard... Um, at Annecy, they did reveal a whole lot more. Uh, just going back to, to my source, they stated that uh, they showed some other stuff uh, in, in which it, it even says, actually, uh, the short was one of more than a dozen of which screened at this week at Annecy. Uh, two on opening night, uh, Mummy, Dum uh, Mummy Dummy and Wet Cement, and the rest at Wednesday's presentation. So if, we're, if we are getting something like this, then honestly, I, I'm definitely optimistic because it's about time that we do see the Looney Tunes going back to their roots, doing what essentially we love them doing. Just chasing each other, always one, one-upping the other, uh, always pulling off pranks and dynamite down their pants, seeing all these crazy explosions. It's just a lot of classic cartoon fun that they want to go and deliver. The only thing that we don't know so far is is the fact that we don't know when or where specifically that they are going to be releasing these cartoons. Because this is honestly something that I feel like it has a lot of strong potential and can really go and help bring back the reputation of the Looney Tunes. Because lately, things haven't been gone well. And I mean, like, even the new shows that they got nowadays isn't necessarily helping out in terms of uh, bringing some rele relevancy back onto the Looney Tunes. Like, the only thing that people seem to be uh, excited about related to the Looney Tunes is literally just uh, Space Jam 2, and that's it. Uh, but honestly, with this, I do feel like now we are going back to why we remember and why we love the Looney Tunes so much. So honestly, I am definitely optimistic and I'm definitely excited to see more of what Warner Brothers Animation has in store with these cartoons and hopefully they will bring them out soon because so far with what we got with Dynamite Dance, that one was absolutely awesome. And uh, major kudos to uh, Peter Browngard and uh, David Gemmel for their effort that they have put in 
with this cartoon in particular. And I do wish the best of luck for all the an artists and animators with what they will have in store with uh, the Looney Tunes cartoons. Okay. Now, with that said, uh, now that I've made my whole statement on this, uh, I would like to go and go into the uh, chat wall. And I want to ask you guys, what do you think so far about uh, Looney Tunes cartoons? And how do you feel about what we have seen with uh, Dynamite Dance? Is this something that you guys are excited for? Do you want to see more about it? Did you like the cartoon? Did you not? Let me know what you think in the chat wall right now. Okay, so, uh, let's see what we got here. I absolutely adored this first look cartoon. I love the music, I love the animation, and of course, I love the gags. Uh, this is something I definitely want to watch when it comes out. I also remember that song being in an episode of Garfield and Friends where John is singing about while feeding Garfield a lot of food. I actually do remember that episode of Garfield and Friends, and, uh, funny enough, um... Uh, the one thing I remember is that, yeah, like, they used the whole Dance of the Hour song uh, in order to do a regular episode. And in a way, I, I think that episode of Garfield and Friends was actually meant to be a whole parody of Fantasia. Because they even opened up with Garfield presenting the, the episode, like, in front of an orchestra and you see him in a suit. So they were going towards that direction. I do remember. Okay, uh, let's see. I am speechless right now. That was really funny. I didn't laugh during this trailer, but I am laughing right now. Uh, I wonder what other cartoons they might have uh, in the show. Daffy Duck, Porky Pig, Farkhorn and Leghorn, and my favorite Pepe Le Pew. Uh, one thing that I can confirm is that for the cartoon Wet Cement, it will be featuring Porky Pig and Daffy Duck, but not just uh, the regular Daffy Duck. This is classic Daffy Duck. The reason why he is called Daffy in the first place. Uh, going back into the comment now. Uh, the possibilities are endless. And for something that was made in the golden years of cartoons with this style, I'm really impressed with what the animators have done. If Tex Avery and Chuck Jones were still alive, uh, they would be really proud of Warner Brothers. All right, that's really nice. Yeah, I, I, you know, honestly, I think they would like this as well. I think they would, they would be proud of the animators, or they would, they would be heavily involved if they were alive. They would play a big role here. Okay, let's see here. Uh, the one minute short looks really impressive. Uh, this is uh, kind of what I miss the most when I used to watch the older Looney Tunes episodes. Uh, I hope to see more of this and Warner Brothers keeps more of this style uh, that me and everybody uh, likes this show more again. All right, that's very nice, dude. Uh, I was fulfilled with dynamite. Uh, what people think about explosions, uh, that has gone boom. I have no idea Michael Bay was around, or it was Warner Brothers itself. I kind of think it was a supreme cartoon. Also, Looney Tunes has not revived or revisited with new look as well. All right, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, I love what they're doing with the Looney Tunes here. Uh, the animation is exceptionally fluid for what they have shown. And come on, uh, and uh, hold on a sec. And uh, come on, it's Bugs Bunny. Uh, where can you go wrong? Uh, I'll submit my own, but I don't want any Looney Tunes cartoon to feel for poorly animated and funny. All right, sweet. Uh, let's see now. Uh, let's see what else. Um, oh man, we still got a lot. Uh, for, or, oh, here we go. Uh, I don't know if you knew about it, but I think the reason that Bugs Bunny has yellow gloves in this short is a reference to either Happy Rabbit, who is kind of like the pre the prototype of Bugs Bunny, in the short Harem Scarum, or Bugs' yellow gloves in Elmer's new rabbit. Oh, no, no, no. Now, yeah, that is something that, uh, is a little detail that I, I, I do know about, and I do get what they're trying to do, because, uh, I do remember... That, well, as we have seen in the cartoon, that Bugs Bunny actually has, like, he actually has yellow gloves instead of the usual white. But that was actually a thing back then in the old cartoons where often that, that is known as kind of like an infamous inconsistency. Uh, not just in the cartoons themselves, but also with the posters. Because sometimes when they would have a poster of either Mickey Mouse or Bugs Bunny or whichever character that would be mostly famous wearing gloves, often the posters, they would present them with, um, with yellow gloves. But in the cartoons themselves, they would actually be white. And that is actually something that they reference in uh, Cuphead, by the way. Like, if you look into the intro of the game, you'll see that Cuphead was wearing yellow gloves, but in the game itself, 
um, he's wearing white gloves. So that's just a, a little reference right over there. All right, so just need uh, one more drink. Okay, so I think with that, um, now it is time that we are going to go on to the next subject. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the uh, presentations that actually happened. Because there have been a lot of companies that have presented what they have in store in the future. Uh, rather it be Paramount Animation, in which they revealed some information regarding the Spongebob movie, It's a Wonderful Sponge, and also revealed that they wanted to make an animated Spice movie. I don't know how the fridge that's going to happen, but okay, good luck on that. Uh, then we also have Warner Brothers Animation. We got Warner Brothers coming in, and of course they revealed a lot of stuff regarding Looney Tunes cartoons, and uh, including, and they also talked about regarding uh, their upcoming movie Scoob, which so far has been getting a lot of positive reception. And then, of course, I talked about uh, Disney Television, what they've revealed, and also uh, plenty of other car companies. Uh, Cartoon Network coming in, talking a lot about Steven Universe, the movie, which is not going to be a legitimate movie, but like a television movie. Uh, Nickelodeon, and all of those companies. But the one that I find to be the most intriguing, and the one that has revealed the most curious projects, would actually be related to Sony Pictures Animation. Now, before I continue to go into this, I just want to mention that you might have seen one of my previous videos that I've released uh, not too long ago called Why Illumination Entertainment is Good. And from there, I talked a little bit about Sony Pictures Animation and a bit of their brief history, and I mentioned how after Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, that they have become a brand new studio. That the days of making cheap cartoons pandering to little children are pretty much dead, and now we are seeing a brand new Sony Pictures Animation that is a lot more experimental. That they emphasize more on trying new things. And this year at Annecy, Sony Animation just proved to me that I am exactly right on that. So with Sony Pictures Animation, they have revealed a lot of information regarding their upcoming stuff. Now, of course, related to the things that are coming out this year and next year as well, uh, they have shown some information related to things like the Angry Birds Movie 2, the Mitchells vs. the Machines, and also Vivo, in which Rich Moore is going to be involved as a producer, and also related to Wish Dragon, in which that one, I don't know if it is going to be coming out worldwide, but they have set a release date sometime later in 2020 just in China in order to really capitalize on the international market right there. So I think it's mainly just for China with Wish Dragon. But that's not necessarily the interesting things that they have revealed. What is very fascinating and the true highlights of Sony Animation's presentation is the content that they want to make for television and for adults. So let me start things off with what they want to do with some of their upcoming movies. And what they have revealed is actually two projects from Yendi Tartakovsky. And the most amazing thing about it is that these projects that they have revealed, they are not Hotel Transylvania related. Yes, just recently, Sony Pictures Animation just discovered that Yendi Tartakovsky is capable of doing more things creatively more so than just creating cheap Adam Sandler cartoons. He can actually do much more than that. He can have other ideas. Now, I know we already know it, but Sony's a little bit slow. Like, they, they need some time to realize that. But yeah, they kind of realize that. And now they want to see if he would be capable of doing plenty of other experimental projects. First of which is actually going to be an R-rated animated feature, which is going to be called Fix. And reading from my source here in the rap, it is described that Fix is about a dog living up his last night as a bachelor upon learning he's getting neutered the next day, which is something that Gindy Tartakovsky is confirmed to go and direct. And then the next project that he has is something that's going to be a lot more, that, or at least it seems 
Like, it's going to be a lot more serious. Possibly something that might be more in the veins of something like Samurai Jack, more like a Star Wars Clone Wars, or with what we're going to get in the future with Primal. And that is something called Black Knight, which is an original action-adventure epic that tells the story of a highly skilled and faithful knight who, after failing to protect his king, must transform himself into the Black Knight to save the kingdom. Oh, but if you think those are pretty interesting, uh, wait till you see the television projects that Sony Animation has. Now, I know that some people might think, oh god, Sony Animation doing television, that's not gonna go well. But, uh, actually, believe it or not, Sony is going far beyond what you think, because these are actually projects that are not based on any of their movies. Which, first and foremost, they actually want to make a reboot of The Boondocks. Yes, Sony Animation is going to be collaborating with Aaron McGruder in order to bring back The Boondocks onto television. In which... Excuse me. <clears throat> in which, uh, let me go and uh, read this. Uh, if In case you don't know what The Boondocks is... It chronicles the adventures of the Freeman family against the evil local government tyrant Uncle Ruckus, who rules the fictional Woodcrest County, Maryland, with an iron fist. So they're going to be bringing back the boondocks. Uh, but also, they are going to be adapting uh, a graphic novel as well into an animated series called Hungry Ghosts, in which uh, the uh, comic itself was made by Joel Rosé and the late Anthony Bourdain, in which it says right over here that Hungry Ghosts will be an anthology of twisted and culinary-inspired ghost stories with both horror and comedic elements. Each episode will range in tone and will look completely different from the last, taking advantage of various forms of animation to best fit each story. And then finally, one more TV show that they have revealed is actually something called Super Bago, which was originally a movie that they wanted to do, but they decided, you know what, uh, we're not going to completely waste it and we're just going to make it a TV show, which is actually going to be a collaborative, uh, uh, well, a collaboration with Stupid Buddy Studios in which um, it states here that the series will be a half-hour comedy that blends claymation and live action and follows the adventures of two dim-witted animated heroes traveling in a very will in a very real Winnebago around the actual America. So that is the main components that we have over here is that Sony Animation decided to go and emphasize not necessarily their upcoming projects, but pretty much making a statement that this is the new Sony animation that they really want to go and experiment with so many different styles, so many different storytelling uh, techniques, and also with many different audiences that they want to appeal not just for kiddies, but also for the adults as well. Something that they want to try to aim for with both television and and with movies, uh, especially with Fix, that even in the, the chat wall, I have seen that some people are stating that already Fix just sounds like an R-rated uh, Secret Life of Pets, which honestly, most likely could be, actually. <laughs> but anyways, going back, uh, but, the th but really, they want to show that this is the new Sony animation and they, that they really want to try new things because technically, this is not necessarily the first time that we see Sony animation diving into television. But uh, let's be very honest. Their first tries w on television, oh God, it's a, it's a disaster. Oh boy. Now, I, I, like, technically, the Hotel Transylvania series is one thing, but that, that Cloudy with a Chance of Meatball series... Oh, oh God. Oh boy. Not even the most biased and devoted Sony fan could even defend that. That, that thing, that, that, that thing really does show that just the whole cloudy franchise in general that Sony developed, that's just a train wreck. That, that thing was a mistake. That, I think that's the main thing that it proved. So yeah, they, they were off to a bad start, but now 
it seems like Sony Animation wants to really try something new, that they really want to go and try different things, and try things that would be a little bit more adult. Especially, well, the Boondocks is not necessarily going to be something for kids. Uh, I remember watching a lot of episodes of the Boondocks, and I love the series because not, like, not only does it have some hilarious moments, but also it's one of the most clever animated series that I have seen that... In a lot of in a lot of these episodes, they actually do have some very strong commentary. And also, if there is something that they want to say, like they would just go all out and legitimately say it. Like regarding aspects like if Martin Luther King were still alive today, he would be pissed off. Or that yes, R. Kelly is uh, a sexual predator. Or that they would say uh, like yeah. Um, Oh, one, one thing that they would always do is that they would always slam BET. That, oh my god, the Boondocks has a passionate hatred for BET. And also that they would say things like, yeah, the Tyler Perry, like, he can pretend to be a Christian, but, like, the dude's just dumb and gay. <laughs> so that, that that's kind of the big things that they want to do. And um, honestly, hearing about the Boondocks coming back... I feel like, honestly, even with Sony Animation collaborating, I do feel like this could actually be um, a, a great series, honestly. Th if Sony Animation is serious about bringing back the Boondocks, and especially bringing back Aaron McGrudder, uh, is it? Yeah, McGrudder into this. Uh, I feel like this is going to be something that will hold on to a lot of promise. And it's not just that either. Honestly, I am highly intrigued with many of the other stuff that Sony Animation has brought out, especially with some of their TV shows. Well, Super Bago, honestly, like, I am kind of on the fence. I, I would be more of a wait and see kind of attitude on that because it does sound like they want to experiment a lot with the animation, but the series itself, it just kind of sounds like if Beavis and Butthead had superpowers and that's pretty much it. So, honestly, with that one, I don't know. I feel like I would have more of a wait and see attitude. But Hungry Ghosts. Now, that is actually a series that sounds like they can have a lot of strong potential. It's a little bit like if what, what Warner Brothers Animation is doing right now with the Looney Tunes cartoons. Hungry Ghost could be something that Sony Animation would have that would have a very similar premise. That they could bring in a bunch of their artists and animators and that they could try something new with uh, many of these stories. If, especially with the fact that they would say that they are taking advantage of various forms of animation... To best fit each story. And if they could be as experimental with Spider-Verse. Then imagine with what they can do with each episode of Hungry Ghosts. And maybe Sony can actually deliver something like. Um, uh, what's that series on Netflix? Uh, like Love, De Love, Death and Robots. You know. It'll be something a little bit similar to that. But um, especially now that it is based on an actual comic. And that they will have stories of that. Maybe this could actually turn out to be really good and really consistent. So that is something that I do feel like they would actually have some very high hopes for. And as for uh, the projects that they have revealed in terms of the uh, movies with Genny Tartakovsky. Um, I will say with Fix, that is something, again, just like Super Bago. I feel like I would be a little bit on the fence because like I stated before... Uh, it does sound a lot like it's just going to be an R-rated Secret Life of Pets. And that this is something that they'll try to do a little bit more like with Sausage Party. Or at worst, this could be like another Happy Time Murders. Where they want to present themselves as a kid's medium. But oh, they're trying to be so edgy where they're just going to fill this up with nothing but... Se like there's going to be a whole bunch of sex jokes, drug jokes... And just emphasize on that more so than an actual story itself than actually having uh, a clever commentary. Or, it, it like, honestly, that could be something that I do hope that it would be like Sausage Party. That they would include an actual commentary for itself to be tasteful. So, I am hoping on that. But, honestly, with Fix, that would be something I would be more of a wait and see kind of thing. Especially the fact that it is from Gendy Tartakovsky. The fact that he is directing. And, I mean... Let's be honest, with his track record with Hotel Transylvania, it is something that's like, yeah, nah, man, nah, I don't know. He is not, like, 
I don't care what many people say. I know they have their nostalgia goggles for Dexter's Lab and Samurai Jack and whatever, but he is not a good movie director at all. And I mean, you can make up a lot of the excuses regarding Hotel Transylvania and pin the blame on Sony and Adam Sandler, but a lot of it is because of Gendy, and that is why a lot of them... They just don't work well as movies. That they just feel like they're just really enforcing the stereotype that animation is a kid genre. But from there, I will say, on the other hand, Black Knight, however, does sound like it has a lot of promise. If that thing can be as serious as Samurai Jack or Star Wars then honestly, that would be something that I feel like I would be totally down for, especially uh, with uh, Gendy Tartakovsky's more serious tone, then that could be something that could complement a little more in a feature film setting. That could be something that will have a lot more promise. But with all that said, though, I just want to emphasize one thing before we can continue. Uh, I just want to say, though, that even though... A lot of these projects do sound pretty exciting. Keep in mind that for now they are just in development and there is still that chance that maybe not any of these are actually going to happen because more so than any other studio, Sony Animation, they kind of have a bit of that reputation of jumping the gun when it comes to their upcoming projects. That they will prominently display what they would have in store in the future. That they would show like all these amazing ideas and amazing movies and concept arts and clips and stuff like that. And then suddenly you wait a year later and then they'll say like, oh, yeah, sorry, it's canceled. I mean, we've seen this before with like Medusa, with Popeye and plenty of other projects, they do have a bit of a habit of doing that. I know that, I, I know like plenty of other studios that they would do the same thing a little, be, a, a little bit, but none are more prominent than Sony. None, uh, none would jump the gun more so than Sony. So don't be surprised if there is a possibility that stuff like the Boondocks or Hungry Ghosts or a Super Bago, or even getting Tartakovsky's films, that they might end up being cancelled eventually. Especially with Gendy Tartakovsky's movies. Now that is something that I'm not going to hold my breath that they will exist no matter what. Because you never know if Sony Animation might pull off something like, um, you know, they, they want him to do something else and all these are going to be cancelled. Because here's the thing, and I'm just going to say this right now. If Sony Pictures Animation announces that Gendy Tartakovsky is going to be directing and working heavily on Hotel Transylvania 4, then these movies, Black Knight and Fix, they are dead. They are cancelled. And don't say otherwise. You know that it's going to happen. We've seen this happen with Popeye and Can You Imagine? So they are going to be doing... They, they could possibly do that as well with these two projects, with Fix and Black Knight. You know it could happen. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a warning. But overall, even if these projects don't necessarily exist, that's not necessarily the main message that Sony Animation wants to bring out. The main message that they want to say at Annecy is the fact that this is a brand new Sony Pictures Animation. That the days of Emoji Movie, Smurfs, Cloudy, and Hotel Transylvania are long dead and that now they are embracing a brand new image where they are embracing the experimental, that they are embracing new different ways of storytelling and also embracing uh, telling stories that could either be just for kids or even just for adults as well. They are trying new things things and that's what they mainly want to do with this now is this going to work that is something that we will have to wait and see but honestly for me i have to say that i am highly optimistic of this new sony pictures animation um if this succeeds if they can manage to pull these off and they can actually release them and then honestly I think there's going to be a really bright future for Sony Pictures Animation. And I really do wish the best of luck of, of all the crew at Sony Animation to go and deliver this brand new image. To pretty much make that old image long dead. And to make this one as best as it can be. 
All right, so now with that said, I want to go into the chat wall and I want to ask you guys, what do you think of Sony Animation's new image and all the new projects that they have announced? Do you feel like this is something that you're excited for Sony Animation? Which one is your favorite project? Which one is your least favorite project? Uh, let me know what you all think about all this. All right. Uh, let's see now. Um... Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll go over here. Uh, I'm glad that Sony is willing to explore and try something unique, especially with allowing... allowing oh, boy. <laughs> wow, I don't know. I think someone has a bit of a rough time with autocorrect. Allowing Je Gendi, uh, Gendi Jordan State... Gendi Tartakovsky. Uh, only thing is that I am worried... Uh, and I'm calling call me a nervous freak, but I don't want anybody to give other animation companies that the, the stuff are crap and that they'll never be good with Sony instead of saying that they could be good like Sony, but still can go give out some good quality. And eh, you never know, and especially with the cartoon community, like they, they can get obsessive and like too emotionally invested over crap like that. So eh, I'm not, not holding promises. Okay, let's see here. Uh... For the things Sony has announced, the Boondocks is my most hyped up thing. Uh, this is the Sony we should see. No cartoony animation, just something awesome and interesting. I was worried that Sony might break their promise by doing of doing good, but I was surprised. And I'm glad that Sony is bringing back the Boondocks creator. Uh, because when you reboot a cartoon without its creator, it definitely turns out to be ter terrible. Sony, I'm proud of you. So proud of you. Yeah, honestly, yeah, and that's something I'm really glad about. Like, they brought back the creator for the Boondocks, so we could have something great with that one. Oh, man, I do hope that they can bring back the glory of the Boondocks. Oh, gosh, such a great show, man. When 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 the Boondocks is great, it is freaking phenomenal. Let's see. I'm interested in Sony Animation Studios products and development like Gendy's two R-rated films. Well, they're not both R-rated. Fix is confirmed to be R-rated. Uh, and the Boondocks reboot since uh, the last season was crap. Yeah, that is true. Uh, that is the one major criticism that the Boondocks had, especially with the old series, is the fact that it had a good streak, but then suddenly the last season, I think it's season four, uh, correct me on that, but the last season, oh god, did it fall flat. Like, it was uh, pretty embarrassing for them. Okay, uh, anyways, uh, going back into this, uh, these are a lot of interesting projects that Sony is making, and I would like to see them take advantage of that. Uh, for the blaming on Sony for having say, uh, for having them saying animation is for kids, you kind of realize that they were the people that kind of doesn't, uh, uh, I forgot to say. Anyways, uh, uh, going back into the projects, uh, sorry, it's just like, sometimes more comments would keep coming up and down. Uh, it gets crazy. So, okay, back to what I was saying. Uh, as for the projects, I would like to see uh, Black Knight and the anthology to come out to come to life in the future. Overall, I'm looking forward uh, to this, and I hope it gets made. All right, that's nice. Uh, let's see. Uh, Fix seems like a fun animated film for adults to enjoy. A film about a dog getting his balls chopped off is a brilliant idea. Uh, something that my mom regretted doing with my cat. Anyways, I just hope Sony uh, really improves. I'm just surprised that they didn't announce any anything Ghostbusters related. Well, first they need to go and try to re-reboot the series right now since they got the uh, 2020 film going on. Okay, so, uh, hold on a sec, just need one more water. Now with all that said, it is time that we shall go and jump onto the grand finale. And for this one in particular, considering all the amazing news that we got, I needed to make sure that we had to end this off with a bang. And there was actually one piece of news that I actually did found that could even top anything that was revealed at the Annecy International Animation Film Festival. There was just this one trailer that just came out of nowhere that is based on a project that I actually talked about not too long ago in Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. And from there, like, I didn't know what the fridge was going on, but now we do have a little bit of a clue of what's going to be happening. And the only thing that I will say is, um, Joey, if you're watching this or listening to this or whatever, dude, you are absolutely right. You were totally right about what you just said. And let's go ahead 
and check out the trailer for the Banana Splits movie. Yes, folks, uh, yep, that was it. The Banana Splits movie. That's what we're gonna get. Now, before I get things started into talking about my thoughts on, uh, what we just witnessed with that, I just want to say, first of all, ever since I first heard about the concept of this, one thing that I've always wanted to try to avoid is to compare this to Five Nights at Freddy's. I feel like comparing the Banana Splits to Five Nights at Freddy's was such a knee-jerk reaction. Like, it was something that you immediately act before you think to say. Like, you see an image of the Banana Splits, and you would say, Oh, it's Five Nights at Freddy's! Oh, it's Five Nights at Freddy's! Hey, look, it's Five Nights at Freddy's! Hey, isn't that Five Nights at Freddy's? It's Five Nights at Freddy's! Yeah, I, I just feel like, honestly, it, it, like... It's saying that it's Five Nights at Freddy's and just making that comparison, it really does undermine the project itself or even just the banana splits in general. That it just makes it difficult to look at it as its own thing. But then, this trailer came in. And honestly, from what I've just seen, I give up. I, I honestly do. There's no other way that you can say it. This is a legit Five Nights at Freddy's movie. Everything that you see, it's pretty much Five Nights at Freddy's. The only exception is that instead of a Chuck E. Cheese pizzeria, this movie is set in a kid's show where it's recorded in front of a live studio audience. And that's pretty much it. Down to the point where now everything else is pretty much the exact same concept as Five Nights at Freddy's and even... The character, the freaking characters themselves, like somehow they're robots, believe it or not. Like you see one of the characters, that, like his eyes are glowing red, but probably the most insane image that we have seen, where, where is it? Yeah, this one right over here is when we see one of the characters, like it's, it's the dog character with his tongue sticking out and that part of his face is ripped off to see that there is like this robot skeleton it's like okay now we're just going into freaking wallace and gromit territory like holy crap the dog turns out to be a freaking robot like seriously like it's pretty much hinting to us that oh inside the costumes it's not actors it's actually just a bunch of robots or maybe they could be doing something that's similar to five nights at freddy's 3 where it is part costume part animatronic but honestly i look at this and i'm asking why is it even a robot in the first place? Like, you look at the co- Just- Here's the thing. You look at these costumes. Like, what is it that makes them a freaking robot in the first place? Why do they have to be a robot to begin with? Because there's nothing about them that's mechanical. You know, you don't- You know, you don't see, like, the elephant's trunk moving. You don't see any of their mouths moving at all. Like, what is it about them- that has to be, ro like, why do they have to be robots? And especially at the, uh, at the end, when you have to, like, where, where the fridge is that image? Hold on, just to continue forward. Yeah, like, you got the mom right over here. Where the mom has to, yeah, like, now somehow they gotta make the mom character to have her become Sarah Connor at this point. Where she has to be the one to take down all the freaking robots. And th that's basically the main idea, is that... They, they just want to make this a horror film where the banana splits are now the, the villains who are killing these random people one by one. Like, if there's a douchebag that you don't like in this movie, well, don't worry. The banana splits are going to be coming in and just tra-la-la-la-la-la dead. You know, that's pretty much their main goal. And the way they have to kill them, they have to do so in an over-the-top cartoony way. Like, the best example is when you see the dog... He, he pretty much puts this one person in a mat in that magic box like you know that box where the magicians would use to saw their assistants in half that's basically the way that one of the characters wants to go and kill one of the people like you, you just see him it's like the dude's like you let me out man and just like puts up the saw just dead like I look it's like honestly 
looking at this, I like, and especially thinking about the concept of taking the banana splits and turning that into a horror movie, taking a classic Hanna-Barbera series, and you gotta turn it into something evil and twisted. And I'm just looking at this like, what the fridge? It really actually did feel like sci-fi wanted to legitimately make a Five Nights at Freddy's movie, but then suddenly um, they couldn't do so because I, I believe it was Blumhouse that already got the movie rights. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. So they decided, well, instead, we're just, like, how about we just take something like the Banana Splits? They look like Five Nights at Freddy's, so let's go and capitalize on that. But one thing I will say is that, honestly, this is actually pretty good timing, considering that Five Nights at Freddy's is seeing a bit of a revival right now. In case you don't know, or in case you haven't seen it on YouTube, uh, many of the Let's Players and many of the video game related channels, uh, right now they are focusing heavily on the brand new VR game Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted, which is rebooting a bit of the popularity of Five Nights at Freddy's. And considering that this one is coming very soon, um, you know, it is honestly pretty good timing that now Five Nights at Freddy's is actually pretty relevant again and that people are enjoying content of Five Nights at Freddy's like it was back, I believe, was it five years ago since Five Nights at Freddy's? Was it like in 2014 or something? Like, holy crap. Alrighty, Five Nights at Freddy's is five years old. Like, going back, or four to five years old, well, one of the two, whatever, but... Yeah, just seeing this, it really does feel like it is trying to be a Five Nights at Freddy's, but with the banana splits. But honestly, the, the thing is, is that, of course, like, some of you might be watching this or listening to this, and you see this and you're thinking about, like, yeah, this is gonna be bad, this is gonna be terrible. Honestly, I do agree with you, but the thing is, is that this looks like it is so bad, this looks like it is so terrible, that it was done on purpose. These filmmakers know exactly what they are doing with this. And I feel like, honestly, what they're trying to do with the Banana Splits movie is that they're trying to make it uh, for the same audience as... Um, what was it? They're trying to do it for the same audience who likes Sharknado. They want to try to make a so bad it's good movie where you just are highly entertained by the cheesiness of it all. You just enjoy the entire corniness with the hammy acting, with the cheap looking kills, and all the stupid ways that they try to create this movie. That's the true enjoyment. They want you to enjoy this in the same way that you would enjoy Sharknado. That you just enjoy the goofy violence delivered by the Banana Splits. Which they're not holding back considering that this does have an R rating for horror violence and gore. For the freaking Banana Splits out of all things. <laughs> yeah, this... This freaking doopy, d this derpy looking cartoon dog is gonna be the one that will be spreading blood and guts everywhere. Like, honestly, they, and like I said before, they know exactly what they're doing. They know the kind of thing, they know the kind of movie that they want to do. They, they just want to make something that's just honestly stupid and ridiculous and to have people have fun with all that, and honestly for me, as someone who actually used to watch and unironically enjoy uh, the Banana Splits, the original series, as a kid, honestly I look at this and I'm like, I really don't know what to say. Honestly, even to this day, I still find it very difficult to know what, how to describe this, how to say, like, what is it that I just watched? How can I express how I feel when seeing this, it's, you know, it's, it's honestly difficult. It's like, I don't know how to feel about this. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to feel. All I know is that they're taking the banana splits and they're turning it into Five Nights at Freddy's. Quite literally right now, with legitimate proof. So, that's pretty much the whole thing with the freaking banana splits. And if you guys are actually curious about when this is going to be coming out... Well, apparently it will be, uh, it will actually be released on Blu-ray and DVD sometime in, in, in this summer, actually. So it's, it's going to be very soon. And then later this year, it will be premiering on the Sci-Fi Channel. So that's the big thing with the Banana Splits movie. And, uh, oh 
boy, I don't know what the fridge to expect with this. Maybe you guys will probably have a better answer than me, so I would like to know, what do you all think of this? Is this something that you want to watch? Do you want to see something that's so bad it's entertaining? Uh, are you interested in this or not? Let me know what you think. I need a clearer answer for all this, man. Okay. Let's see now. Uh, I can't believe this ex this existence is coming out. I, I feel this is a combination of Five Nights at Freddy's with Terminator elements in there. I feel like Hannah and Barbara should be rolling in their graves uh, right from the way they're doing this. Uh, if you think that's bad, have you seen the new posters of Child's Play reboot where Chucky, Chucky keeps killing Toy Story characters? Uh, I thought it looked stupid and I feel like it's very offensive to me. I wish they could just unsee it. Well, honestly, I will give uh, Child's Play some credit. Because honestly, I disagree with you. I feel like the Child's Play, uh, the, the Child's Play posters, they are actually very clever. Especially with the fact that Child's Play would be released at the same time as Toy Story 4. So I do get what they were trying to do with it. And I thought it was cute. I thought it was funny. But in this case right over here, it's just, yeah, I don't know. And I do feel like, yeah, if this is not the kind of thing for you, then like, if you're not into this, you're going to despise it. That I can guarantee. Uh, let's see here. What else? Dear Mother, uh, you are not going to like this. You saw the original show as a kid, and this won't bring you back those memories. It will scar you for life, just like the Fly movie. Also, the fact that it is R-rated, but has a lot of kids in this movie. It's going to be one of those few R-rated movies that doesn't mind kids watching as long as they have a strong stomach or gore. Probably, who knows. <laughs> The trailer looks interesting. Most people would compare this to Five Nights at Freddy's, and I can't understand why people would make this comparison. Oh, really? But to me, uh, this feels like an episode of Bodcat Goldway's Misfits and Mayhem. It tells a socially relevant story with an imaginative twist, and each tale parodies pop culture norms and exploits the awkwardness of its flawed characters. Uh, okay, I'm gonna be honest with you. I would be shocked. If there's a legitimate commentary in this movie. Like this, the, out of all things, the Banana Splits movie will have something to say about an element in our society. I would be shocked about that, honestly. Like, holy crap. Like, they want to try to do something clever with this. Oh boy, maybe it will. But I would honestly be shocked. <laughs> okay, anyways. um, I've never heard of this. But that was outrageous to see if Five Nights at Freddy's and Banana Splits have in common. It's soon to be the best horror movie for Halloween since the 2004 movie Saw. You never know. He could be right on that. This could be a cult phenomenon, so you better get ready for that. Okay, oh, this is interesting. I actually really like this trailer and would like to see it when it comes out. Yes, I know it's going to be bad since it is a sci-fi movie, but it seems like the kind of bad that I can go and have a good time with. Well, that's kind of the thing, though. That That's what they want to do. They try to make a so bad it's entertaining thing, and that's what they're hoping for the best. Let's see. Sweet Merciful Neptune. This trailer got my attention so much. If the Banana Splits horror movie is a hit... I hope they get a Barney the Dinosaur horror movie about Barney loving kids too seriously. Okay. Um. No. No, just no. Just like when you go into D, you know, I was, I was with you at first, like thinking about, okay, maybe a Barney the Dinosaur horror movie that could be possible. But then like the description of like what they want to do, is just no, no. Trust me, I do not, like, maybe a Barney the Dinosaur movie would actually work out pretty well as a horror film, but a Barney Weinstein movie? Hell no. Just, that's a no, man. That is a no. Okay, uh, let's see, one more, one more thing. Let's see, for those people who hate the trailer or hate how the banana splits are portrayed, to quote Kermit the Frog, one man's poison, one man's poison is another man's bacon. Exactly, and I think that should be the perfect note to go and end off this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. And holy crap, 
what an adventure this has been because let me tell you this week it has been quite insane trying to set up both podcast episodes for E3 and the regular episode, especially with all the fantasy news. So with all that said and done, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode well. I hope you guys had a lot of fun, and hopefully we could still have a lot more fun, but hopefully not too crazy with the amount of news for the next Animat's Crazy Cartoon cast. So with all that said and done, I would like to say thank you guys so much for watching, and until next time, see you later dudes!